Good morning. I'm glad each of you are here. Um, I'm going to just combine a welcome and some announcements because we're going to do communion later on. If you got a communion cup, which has both your wafer and the juice in it, um, that's good. Hold on to it. And at the end of worship, uh, we will peel those babies off and have communion together. So uh, if you didn't get a cup, if you raise your hand, um, Elaine will come and give you one. Uh, and also when it's time to do communion, if you fumble and can't get the top off the cup, which I didn't last time we had communion, I couldn't do it, uh, Elaine will come by with some gloves on and help you figure it out. So let's do some quick announcements here. First of all, hang time, our basketball outreach, uh, is shifting into a different gear starting now. Uh, instead of being Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 4.30 to 8.30, they're just going to be uh, Wednesdays at 5 p.m. And as it gets colder, uh, they're going to be transitioning to inside. So they'll have a bunch of fun in the youth room downstairs, and we just want to continue to pray for them. Uh, if you have a, a desire to work with young people, I can't really call them youth. Some are college age, some are high school age, some are younger. Um, but uh, just see me, and I'll put you in touch with Shanae, and she'll help you. Also, Hang Time is going to be meeting the first and third Saturdays of every month from 3 to 5. And that'll be more event-driven and, you know, some special planning and stuff, where the weekly group will be almost like a youth group uh, with Bible study and prayer and talking and, and that sort of thing. Uh, secondly, how many have your 30 days of uh, prayer and fasting booklet? Great. Um, well, we are calendar challenged in the office, so I thought that October 3rd to November 3rd would be 30 days. Not so. Uh, it's actually like, I don't know, 32 days. So uh, we decided to start the 30 days of prayer and fasting on Monday, which is actually October 5th, and then it really is 30 days, and the last day that we're praying and fasting, uh, in this round anyway, will be on Election Day. So um, this is... In case you don't have it or you're watching from home, uh, this is the booklet that Kathy put together. We actually stole this from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, um, and it's just giving us something specifically to pray for each of the, of the 30 days. I also want you to add a couple things each day to your prayer list. We just want to pray for the nation. Um, I don't know when the, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association did this, but... Uh, it might not have been while we were in COVID. It may not have been while we were suffering with uh, racial injustice and rioting and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, the election. So there's a lot to pray for, especially for our nation uh, and for COVID and, and that sort of thing. So remember that. Also, we want to pray for our church. Uh, it seems like every fall the leadership team uh, thinks about fresh ideas. What are we going to do? Uh, this year, uh, how are we going to budget for next year? And you can't do a budget unless you know some of the exciting things you want to do. So pray for the leadership uh, over the next month or two as we uh, sort of seek those things out. Okay. Well, let me just open in prayer and we'll get started with worship. Heavenly Father, you are so blessed. You are due all glory and honor. And we are here, Father, to worship you because we are yours. So, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and fill us. Receive this worship. Let it be a sweet aroma to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to stand and join us, I invite you to do so now as we begin the altar.
did was praise. All I do is worship. Lord, I will just bow down. I'm just gonna stay.
come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. We're going to continue to worship by taking communion this morning. Y'all can be seated. And um, grab your little cup if you got one on the way in. If you didn't, raise your hand. Elaine will bring you one. And, um, you know, we celebrate communion. Used to do it twice a month before COVID hit. Now we're decided we'll probably do it the first Sunday of every month for a while until things change a little bit. And um, we do it 
because it's one of the last things that Jesus did with his disciples. And maybe one of the most meaningful. He was about to go to the cross. Some of the disciples may have had a bit of an idea uh, what was going to happen to him, but most of them probably didn't. And they certainly didn't understand the salvation that he was going to receive for us at the cross. So we celebrate communion. Um, if you take the kind of the see-through top off, it's tricky to grab, you'll see a little wafer. You can take that off. If you accidentally pulled the bottom not-so-see-through wrapper first, then you're in trouble. Elaine will have to give you a whole new thing because that's hard. Um, but once you got your wafer in your hand, take the other top, careful not to spill everything on top of you, or drop your wafer. You don't want to do that either. Let's see. All right. Hallelujah. You know, the, the Last Supper was probably easier than this because there was bread and wine all over the table. And Jesus said, um, he took the bread in his hand. He said, you know, this is my body broken for you. As often as you have a meal like this, and this was their most basic meal, they would have had it all the time. As often as you have bread and you have wine, um, remember me, remember what's happening today and celebrate it. And he did the same thing with the wine. He took it and he said, as often as you eat and drink this, remember me. Because, and we learn this later on in the Bible, the new covenant was written in his blood. The first covenant, the law said you have to be perfect, you have to do all these things to come back to God and nobody could do it. The second covenant, the new covenant, says no, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to follow every commandment just to get back to God because Jesus opened a door that anyone can walk through. And that's what the cross represents, our salvation. So today we take... The bread representing the broken body of Christ and the juice representing his blood. Hallelujah. Um, one thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about the 30 days of prayer if you are on our emailing list, which I hope you are, and if you're not, just see me after church and I'll get your email address and put you on. Um, Kathy, our administrator, will be sending out every day uh, what we would see in the booklet. So if you left your booklet at the office or at home or at church or whatever, just check your email every morning and she will remind you to pray and that sort of thing. We, we talk about different ways to fast. And even in the booklet, booklet in the last page, they give you some ideas of how to fast. I've chosen mine, and I'm, I don't want to tell you what it is because you might think, well, you're pretty wimpy. You're a pastor. You should just totally fast. Well, there you go. I'm okay with what I'm doing, uh, and I hope you all are, are as well. Okay, I want to read a children's story that I wrote a while ago, and I wrote this because of World Communion Sunday, and you may have never heard of that because World Communion Sunday, I think it started as a Methodist thing or a Wesleyan thing, and then it sort of caught on with other churches. And the idea is that um, there's one Sunday a year, and it happens to be today, uh, that theoretically all the churches of the world are taking communion together, or at least within the same 24-hour period. And uh, when I first learned about that, which was actually in the church I pastored before this one, I thought, well, that's really cool, and it inspired me to write this uh, children's story. Once upon a time, there was a town called... And in Gopherville, there's a gopher named? Well, Gilly Galley and his family were in church, and it was World Communion Sunday. The pastor explained that it was a very special day because gophers all over the world were taking communion at the same time. In fact, humans and beavers and deer and most of the other animals were all taking communion in their churches that day all over the world. Gilly Galley felt that that was very special. The pastor was wearing a special robe that Sunday. He usually got dressed up when the church had communion, but since this was even more special, even for a communion Sunday, he wore a long white robe with beautiful colors hanging around his neck and around his waist. 
Although he looked very nice and very colorful, he didn't look very comfortable. Gilly Gally couldn't remember him ever wearing a robe before, and he was moving rather slowly. Silly Sally was told by her parents that she would be allowed to take communion that day for the very first time. They had a talk the night before, and Silly Sally understood that communion represented something very, very important. When the gophers ate a little piece of bread and drank a little bit of juice, it was to remember when Jesus died on the cross. Silly Sally knew about Jesus dying on the cross. She also knew he rose from the dead three days later. She had learned all that in vacation Bible school. She knew that Jesus had come down from heaven, born in a manger with shepherds around, living a really good life, always doing what God, his father, wanted them to do. And then he gave up his life so that we could believe in him and go to heaven. Now, normally, elder gophers would come to the front and the pastor would give them the bread and the juice to give to the rest of the gophers in church. But this time... The pastor first came forward with a globe. It was about the size of a basketball and had all the countries of the world on it. He started saying something about World Communion Sunday when it happened. He took a step, caught his shoe inside his robe, then he lost his balance and fell forward. The globe went flying into the air and the pastor went falling down the stairs. Everyone in the church gasped. Then Silly Sally heard the pastor say a word that she had never heard in church before. Then everyone gasped again. The elder gophers helped the pastor back to his feet, but the whole church was watching the globe, which had shot out from the pastor's hands and was rolling down the center aisle. It went right out the door and down the front steps of the church. Everyone heard it bouncing down the steps toward the street. And then they heard Mumbly Grumbly, who sometimes waited outside the church if he was late to the service. He let out a howl and said, Okay, God, I'll go in. You don't have to hit me over the head. Inside, the pastor stood back up, straightened out his very colorful robe, and said, Today is World Communion Sunday, the end. Uh, before I start, let's, let's spend a couple minutes in prayer uh, just before the sermon starts. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you've called us to be a church here in central New York. Lord, we thank you that even with a a pandemic on the loose. You have found a way within even this church to meet together, whether it's online or in person, that you have uh, helped us to get a whole lot smarter about digital stuff so that we could still be together even when we're apart. Lord, we pray for all the churches that are doing the same thing or struggling to do it. We pray for those who are uh, not as gifted as we are with people in our church in this area. We pray that you would help them to do what their congregation needs to come together. Father, we do recognize that the many churches in central New York that bow their knee to you believe your word and are seeking to bring people to your side. Lord, we value them. We see them as brothers and sisters. We are but one store in a huge franchise. So, Father, we pray that you'd bless those leaders and their families. Bless the congregations. Let each one of us be a light on a hill that people that don't yet know you would look at all of us and say, wow, there's something going on there. I, I want that. Father, we pray that revival would break out, that people would be coming to church maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time. And, Lord, they would seek you out, and we would be the church that you want us to be. Heavenly Father, bless those doctors and nurses that are trying to take care of us as a, as a nation, as a population. Uh, take care of those who are sick, from our president and his wife and the cabinet and senators and congressmen, all the way down through the, the state and local governments. Lord, take care of those who are sick. Help us to recover. I pray that you'd be with those researchers and scientists that are working on vaccines and cures and treatments. Give them wisdom, Father. Let this be a short pandemic break the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you know, in, uh, in the Bible, it says that Jesus said to his disciples at one point, you are salt and light in the world. I didn't put that uh, in your handout. There should be a handout, by the way, if you got a, a bulletin on your way in, a little insert that has all the verses I'm going to read, except for that one, and some fill-in-the-blank stuff. There should be a pen or a pencil in front of the in front of you in the pew, and you can follow along by filling in the blanks if you want to. 
I always find it helpful to track along with a preacher when he does something like that. Um, well, you are salt and light. And when I was in college many years ago, I was in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and, and uh, one time we decided we'd all read a book together, and we chose a book called Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. It was about evangelism and missions. And it, it made a big impression on me. And so as I was thinking, well, what, what would go along well with what we talked about last week and maybe what we'll talk about next week? And I thought, how about that concept of getting out of the salt shaker and into the world? And I, I love the, the graphic that Kathy found for the cover of our bulletin because when you think about it, if you have salt at home, you probably have it in a salt shaker. And it's something just full of salt, and when you need the salt, you shake it on something like that. And the point of this book that I had read was that as Christians, sometimes we just sort of gather together and hide in the salt shaker. And I don't think that's what Jesus meant when he said you will be salt and light in the world. Uh, we talk about light all the time. Practically every Sunday we pray that there would be lights on a hill shining out his love, his glory for those around us. We don't often talk about salt the same way. And so if you picture yourself in a salt shaker with a bunch of salt, kind of like church, kind of like right now, um, that's what I see sometimes, the church hiding in the salt shaker. And the truth is God wants us to get out. Salt doesn't do a whole lot of good in a salt shaker. It needs to get out there. It used to preserve meats and things like that. Now we mostly use it for flavoring. But either way, the destiny of salt is not to stay in the salt shaker. So, let's look at Luke 9. It says, When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet, when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. And this is sometimes called the trial run of the church because Jesus had been talking to his disciples for a long time. He's not done yet, but he's talked to them. They had enough information to at least get out there and do some stuff and they could at least do what he had been doing. So he sends them out two by two. And I think there were 72 of them or something like that that he sent out in one of the gospels, it says. So he sent out not only the twelve, but also the disciples that were hanging out, and off they went. Well, I, I found eight lessons that I want to pull out of this story about the disciples as they went out on their trial run. This could have been maybe referred to as the first great short-term mission trip. Um, if you've never taken a mission trip, even just one for a week or two, I would encourage you to figure out a way to get that done. Um, the first mission trip I took was to Mexico. I had just um, met Jamie, and we had become friends. We weren't, like, dating or engaged or anything like that yet. Um, but we were going to church together a lot of the time, going to a fellowship together. And one day Jamie said, um, I need to take a mission trip. And, you know, I'd never been out of the country except I think I went canoeing in Canada one time. Uh, that was as far as I got, and Canada is just almost like the U.S., so it didn't even count. Um, so we were talking, and she said, yeah, I need to take a mission trip. And I said, really? What are you going to do? She goes, oh, I'd like to maybe go to Mexico. And, you know, I was a, just a middle-class, wimpy little kid, and I thought, why would anybody want to go to Mexico? Who knows what their hospitals are like? Who knows if we can eat the food or drink the water? So I like, really? And she was just adamant. I don't know where she got the idea, except maybe from God. And um, after a while, I thought, you know, maybe I should consider this too. And she was going to go all by herself. I thought, well, that doesn't make much sense. So um, I started praying about it. And then I felt like, you know, I think I, think I should go on this mission trip too. So um, somewhere, and I don't know the chronology, but somewhere between us planning to take a mission trip and us getting engaged, the periods are kind of all in there blurry. So by the time we knew we were going to go on a mission trip, we were engaged. And um, then when I went, like, we talked to our pastors and stuff, hey, we're going to go take a mission trip. And they were like, great, who's going? We said, oh, Jamie and I. And they went, hmm, you know, 
that just doesn't sound really good to me. Uh, why don't you pray about taking someone else or figure out another way to do that? So we prayed about it. And then another girl from our fellowship said, yeah, I'd like to go to Mexico too. And um, she went with us. She ended up getting engaged a couple weeks before we left to a guy, and they got married and moved to Mexico to be missionaries, actually. But for this short-term trip, the three of us went, and we drove from Ohio down to Mexicali, Mexico, which is on the, it's like a town which straddles the border of Mexico and California, and the California side is called Calexico, I think, and the bottom one is called Mexicali. They combine California, you get this, right? You can write it out on paper if you don't figure it out. All right, so it was, um, you'd think it was just over the border, so it was probably just like the U.S. It was nothing like the U.S. Um, we hooked up with a missionary that was down there. He and his family, we stayed with them. Uh, we, he took us everywhere. He was a pretty strong missionary, and he had started house fellowships and all over town. One of them, which was uh, a, a community of people that lived on the outskirts of a dump, and their whole way of of living was to go into the dump each day and look for things like bottles that they could sell for scrap or recycle and i had never seen anything like that i mean i was a kid my dad was a professor my mom got her phd and we were always comfortable enough we never had to worry about food uh and i'd never seen anything like that and i remember i don't know that jamie had either uh she was raised in a pretty similar household and we got there, and I remember uh, Jamie just loves babies, so we, we had our first little uh, ring of chairs, probably 10 people from the dump, and the missionary had his guitar, and his, he was preaching and stuff, and they had a little baby, and Jamie goes, oh, let me hold the baby. And she never fathomed the idea that there could possibly ever be a baby without pampers on. That's all we'd ever known. And uh, sure enough, she got all wet, and uh, it was like, whoa, something's happening here. Um, We learned a lot on that trip, and um, it opened my eyes to what life is like in the world, I mean outside of the U.S., outside of my little middle-class upbringing, and it it put something into my heart that's never left. Now, since that time, once we got married, um, I've taken probably a dozen trips into Latin America, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, mostly Colombia, that's where most of the trips are, uh, Trinidad, Haiti, places like that. And um, I kept going back because I I never wanted to forget what God didn't want me to ever forget, which was America is not everything. America is a very blessed country in the middle of a hurting world. So um, when Jesus sent out the 12 or the 72, whatever it was, um, I don't know if he wanted them to feel the pain maybe the spiritual hunger that the folks who were out there were feeling while they were safe with him as his disciples. Uh, I think maybe that's why he told them not to take an extra tunic or money or anything like that so that they would have to completely rely on God, that they would be as poor as the people they were trying to reach. Uh, Maybe that's how it is. If you've never taken a short-term trip, find a way to do it. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, If we as a church don't send out a short-term mission trip, Sometime the next year, I will put you in touch with another church that will. And uh, we work together, so that could be good for you. It'll change your life. All right, lesson number one. We have been chosen, called, and sent. From 1 Peter 2.9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Uh, We are a chosen people. They're talking about us. Think about that. God chose us. And I I don't go too far with that. I'm not, I I lean more Arminian than I do, what's the other word? Calvinist, thank you. Um, In seminary, I took a test to figure out if I was Calvinist and Arminian, and I turned out to be a two and a half point Calvinist, which is like right on the fence. It's like, you're not really Calvinist, you're not really Arminian, you're not anybody. Um, but I don't, I don't, I wouldn't agree with the Calvinists that say, hey, God chose everyone and, and we don't even have a say in the matter. Uh, but the Bible is clear. In some way, he chose us. He picked us. Now, maybe it was after we gave our heart to him. Maybe it was before. Maybe that's why we gave our heart to him. I don't know. But we are chosen by God. Either we're chosen individually or chosen as a church, but we are chosen. Second Corinthians says, therefore, 
If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore God's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What a convicting passage. We have been reconciled to God. All the goodness, we're saved by grace through faith. God has chosen us. We have been lifted out of sin and into glory with him because of what he's done. This is, this is what God did for us. And then he says, oh, and by the way, what you have received, I now make you an ambassador to give. You need to give to others what you have received. The salvation you got through Christ, you need to give to others. You are literally ambassadors for Christ. Now think of what an ambassador does. Let's say that um, I'm the ambassador from the United States to Russia. Well, first of all, I'm not going to take up residence in the United States anymore, right? I'm going to move to Moscow or wherever the ambassador lives in Russia. And um, I'm going to be living in that foreign country. I can't be the ambassador to Russia and stay here in the U.S. and kind of do it, you know, by Zoom or anything like that. So I go to Russia. They have a place for me. And, you know, I probably might be living in the compound of the American embassy. And as far as Russia is concerned, the American embassy is what? American to uh, soil, right? And they can't just, like, barge in and say, hey, you didn't pay your parking tickets. We're taking you to jail. Because it's American. It's America. So um, if we are ambassadors, we have to figure out where we're ambassadors from. And I would say the kingdom of God kingdom of heaven and where are we ambassadors to this world so can we just hang out in the kingdom of heaven and and just worship all day oh well, might be fun might be good to do that some but in actuality part of our job is to be the ambassadors to the world so we need to be in the world we need to be in the world not of the world but we need to be in the world and everywhere we are in the world is really the territory of heaven And that's a tricky thing to think about. Everywhere your foot... We used to sing a song. Every place on which your foot shall tread, I have given it to you. And the idea was that where we are, the kingdom of heaven is. Because we are linked to Christ. And Christ bought our way in. And so even though I'm taking steps in Liverpool, New York, where I am is uh, part of the territory of heaven. And I need to say, hey, come join this territory that I belong to. I belong to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It's a place that you too can be. Cool. And he ends that little passage not just with saying, wasn't that a nice soliloquy? He says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We implore you. All right, lesson number two. We must answer his call each time he calls. And I just love what, what you see in Isaiah 6, 8. He says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, here I am, send me. And the picture is like jumping up and down. Here I am, here I am, send me, send me, send me. Like God might overlook him. But God is saying, who, who will go for us? Here I am, send me. So for us as Christians, we know we're called. We may even know that where we live is part of the kingdom of heaven. And yet God each day might say, Bill, listen, there's somebody at Walmart who I've been preparing to meet you, at 10.15 today, you better go over to Walmart and meet them. Or they might say, uh, Bill, as you're driving down the street and you see that guy begging, uh, yeah, today's the day. Take a quick stop, talk to him for a minute or two, give him something out of your pocket, and let's see what happens. And each time God calls me to do something like that, I need to be the one that says, here I am, here I am, send me, send me. And that starts with an attitude. A good attitude, not a bad attitude. Because if God says, I want you to do something, and I go, uh, you know, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, then that's just sad. That's the opposite of what God wants. All right, so here I am. Send me. Lesson number three. We minister in Jesus' power and authority. This is a serious thing to consider. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. I think too often we as Christians think, well, we have theology. We have a church that we go to. Those are two fine things. But we can't forget that we have imbued with power. We have been given power by God through the Holy Spirit. We are powerful enough to do the job that God's called us to. Our power comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to who? I'll give you a clue. It's not us. We never did anything deserving all power and all authority on heaven and earth. It was all given to Jesus because he's the only one that lived the life that God was originally expecting and then sacrificed that life for us. So it says, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth, all authority, the authority to do something over here, got it. Over here, got it. The authority to cast out demons, got it. Heal the sick, got it. Preach the gospel, got it. All authorities were given to him on heaven and on earth. And then he says, therefore... I had an old preacher when I was young who used to say, whenever you see a therefore, look before it and see what it's there for. So because Jesus was given all authority on heaven and earth, he says, therefore, go and make disciples. We're not going to make disciples in our own power and strength or by our own cleverness or by the four spiritual laws booklet alone. We're going to be able to make disciples because of what Jesus received when he received all authority. There's another part of Scripture. I don't think I gave you that verse today, but it says, he, Jesus is praying, and, and as the Father had sent me, I have sent them. And the picture is, everything the Father gave to Jesus, Jesus has passed on to us so that we can do the job he wants us to do. Acts 19. Our authority comes from our standing in Christ. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of Lord Jesus over those who were even possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Not a good idea, by the way. If you don't know who you're talking about, you shouldn't talk about it. Seven sons of Sceva, a, Jew a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And one day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, I know about Paul, but who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When the Bible says all authority has been given to Christ, therefore go and make disciples. When Jesus said, I've given you all power when the Holy Spirit comes, the key to receiving all that is being in Christ and Christ in us. It's not enough to know it. These guys knew about Jesus, enough to say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. But they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They probably didn't even spend that much time with Paul as his disciple or anything else. They didn't know Jesus. And so the, the demon said, yeah, I know who Jesus is. Everybody knows who Jesus is. And I've heard of Paul. I think that's so funny. A demon says, yeah, you know, I read the papers. I know who Paul is. You know, my other demon friends were cast out by Paul, so yeah, they told us about Paul. We know who Paul is. But who are you? And you know, if, if we're not connected to Christ, if we are not in Christ and Christ in us, we stand as little chance as the seven sons of Sceva did. We just don't. I don't ever want to stand before a demon and have him say, uh, Bill Miller, who are you? I want him to say, oh, I know who Jesus is. Yep. And I can see you know you do too. So I'm out of here. That's what I want the demons to say. Our authority comes from our standing in Christ. That's what I meant. Lesson number four. We are called to tell and heal. Acts 8. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And this is, this is talking about the, the first passage I had read. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. Um, when the, sorry, this is not about the first passage I read. This is later in Acts when they're starting the church. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. 
Okay, get that. Hold up. Um, years ago, I was a vineyard pastor. I planted a vineyard church. And the vineyard leader uh, wrote a book called Power Evangelism. And the point of his book was, um, we can just go out and tell the story about Jesus, and some people will get saved. And especially if the Holy Spirit's working in their life and stirring them up, their ears will be ready, we'll, we'll talk, they'll listen. He said, but it's really hard to be a non-Christian and see a miraculous thing take place and not suddenly have your ears open. And, and he was saying, if you really want to evangelize uh, with power, allow God to move through you miraculously. It gets people's attention and tell them about Jesus and they'll be like, yeah, I get that. If that's who you're talking about, I want some of that. So here, it's talking about Philip. He did miraculous signs, and they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Now, you know, when Jesus sent out the 72, he he said, Now, I want you to cast out demons. I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to heal the sick. Now, it's 2020. Um, I believe we could cast out demons today the same way they did back then. I think in America demons are a lot more subtle than they were in first century middle east you don't see a whole lot of people throwing themselves in the fire and shrieking and talking in weird voices it's not like a movie or something like that Um, i think our demons are maybe a little bit smarter and maybe trying to fool us with idols like things you might see on tv uh, appealing to our baser nature Um, but i've seen people possessed by demons that christians had to cast the demons out and they did so it still happens today. I just don't think it happened as much or happens today as much as it did uh, in the first century. But you know, I am completely confident that because Christ is in me, if I had to cast out a demon, it would be cast out. That's what I believe. Haven't actually for a long time. The other thing Christ said to do was to heal the sick. Now, we pray for the sick all the time. Before COVID, we twice a month had people come sit on the front row and we would lay hands on them and pray for them. Um, now, if you are sick or something's happening, you call me, I pray for you. I either pray for you on the phone or something like that. I do a lot more praying on the phone these days than I do in person, but it works. God knows that we're praying for you. And healing the sick today is not just healing someone of leprosy or, or being crippled and then not being crippled, but it can be all sorts of things. It can be emotional healing. It can be people who are scarred by a bad childhood or by a bad, bad event. It can be Um, people who are just physically hurt we pray for them and i can't explain to you why i lay hands on a thousand people and a dozen of them get miraculously healed and the rest don't right then some of them get healed later some of them to my knowledge don't get healed from that experience at all i can't tell you why that happens but it doesn't matter to me because the bible says if you're sick go to the elders of the church have them lay hands on you and the prayer offered in faith will raise up the one who is sick So because that's the promise of Scripture, I'll pray for everybody who's sick. And if they don't get immediately well, I don't say to God, oh, you lied to me. I just say, well, I don't understand why that happened. But I do my part. God is in charge of the rest. God is in charge of doing the healing part. I have no power outside of Christ. Lesson five. We must trust him. He will meet all of our needs. Philippians 4. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches, his glorious riches, in Christ Jesus. Luke 22. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they asked. This is a follow-up to what I first read. So they go out. They don't take a purse of money. They do everything that Jesus told them to do. And when they come back, uh, the first thing they say, if you read the passage in the Gospels, is, uh, you know, all those demons, they, they had to submit to us. It was amazing. We didn't expect that. It was awesome. People got healed. People heard the good word. And Jesus said, yeah, I saw Satan like falling out of heaven like lightning. And then he says, by the way, did you lack anything? They said, nothing we lacked. Everything we needed to do the job we had. It's like their mind was off of the money in the bag and a place to stay, and all the things that we would think about if we were going on a short-term mission trip. And they said, wow, we could heal the sick, we could cast out demons, we could preach. We had everything we needed. And you know, someday, even in America, 
at the end of days, it may be that most everything is taken from us because we're Christians. But still, if everything was taken from us, we would still have everything we would need to do the job God wants us to do. We have nothing to be afraid of. And I think Jesus specifically asked them that question to make sure that they knew that when he left and went to heaven, their source of power, their source of resources and all that wouldn't go with him, that they would still have everything they needed. Lesson number six, we only need one house at a time. Now, this is a bit of a stretch, but as I read the passage, I thought, that's interesting. I mean, why would Jesus say, go to a town, find a house to stay in, and just stay there? Don't go from house to house, just stay there. And I thought, well, here's something that I think every Christian ought to know. I think as Christians, we should find a church where the leaders love the Lord, love the saints, and love the lost. Then stay there until God calls you to a new place of ministry. Um, I've been a pastor for 20-some years, and I've seen all sorts of people come to uh, the church that I'm pastoring, and I say, oh, how did you hear of us? And they say, oh, you know, yeah, I've, been, I've been over at this other church for a while, and, and some people said, you know, I should come over and, and try this out. And then and I said, oh, so you go there all the time? Oh, I, don't, I go there once in a while, you know. I just wake up in the morning and, and think about where do I want to go to church today? And I just feel like, oh, goodness gracious, well, keep looking, will you? You don't have to stop here. Because I believe that a church needs people who are committed, who are there. And you only need one church at a time. You don't need to go to one church in the morning and another church in the afternoon, another church in the evening, and next week start over with new churches. I think that that to really be plugged into a community of believers, you need to be there. You need to show up. It's like when I when I do a, a seminar on fatherhood, what's the most important thing to being a father? Showing up. Same thing in church. Just show up. All right, so we only need one house at a time. Ephesians 4. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. In every church, every person is important. Now, I don't want you to think that, that I'm one that says, listen, when you go to a church, you're married for life. You can never leave that church no matter what happens, because I don't feel that way. Um, if the leadership falls... If the church gets off track, if Jesus is no longer the center of their ministry, then you should pray and say, God, do you want me here to kind of try to bring them back to center, or uh, is this a lost cause and you want me to plug in somewhere where you are glorified? And I think that's legitimate. I really do. Um, we, we get married to a spouse. We don't get married to a church. All right, lesson number seven, last one actually, from Matthew 10. Uh, le- lesson seven is we have tremendous influence with God. This should be a humbling idea. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Jesus is saying this. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, Because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Wow. Um, Jamie and I raised four kids, and we had a foster child for a while. And, um, you know, I I was a pastor, so if people were mean to me, I just sort of chalked it up with a, you know, job experience. Um, But if they were mean to my kids, then it was really hard for me to forgive right away. It's like, come on, you can do whatever you want to me, but don't be mean to my kids you know? Um, And it's because my love for them was so strong that I would be more protective and and maybe even um, defensive toward them than I was even to myself. Well, in a way, God feels that way about us. He doesn't want us to be hurt. He doesn't want people to look down at us, to treat us badly, and that sort of thing. And so he says, by the way, however they treat you, they're treating me. Wow. Wow. When somebody's mean to me, especially because I'm a Christian, I mean, if I cut them off in traffic and they're mean to me, I just deserve that. But if, I, if I'm a Christian, I try to tell them the truth in a loving, respectful way, and they just make fun of me, I don't immediately feel like, oh, man, I'm so mad at you. What I immediately feel is, oh, man, don't do that. You don't know what you're endangering yourself to. Because the guy who's standing behind me, the one I represent, I'm his ambassador, 
When you say that to me, it's like you're saying that to him. And I try to convince them that what I'm saying is true and God's love for them is true, including God's love for me. So don't throw away what I'm trying to tell you. As people treat you, that's how they're treating Jesus. As they treated Jesus, that's how he said my father feels. Matthew 16, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, most of you know I come from a more uh, independent, charismatic background when I was very young. And I heard all sorts of preachers preach this verse and apply it to the wackiest things. And I never really felt real comfortable with what they were saying. Um, And to this day, I'm not sure I completely understand what he's talking about binding and loosing on earth. It's bound and loosed in heaven. I can't give you any definitive um, teaching on that. But I can tell you that in some sense, Jesus is saying what you do on earth affects what is done in heaven. So it's not just how people are treating you that they'll pay for, but what you do on earth has an effect on something that's going on in heaven. Binding, loosing, I don't get all that. But I know that what I do on earth has eternal consequences in heaven. I'm not just flailing around, shadow boxing, as Paul would say. I'm not beating the air. Something is happening with us when we act like God's representatives on earth. That's a serious thing. Wow. Now, with all that influence over God, or with God, how should we use this? Luke 9 says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead and They went into Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. You guys remember the sermon I preached on Samaria. They weren't Jews. They were hated by Jews. And so if they were walking through Samaria and somebody said, yeah, I'm going to Jerusalem, they would say, yeah, well, you're a Jew going to Jerusalem, you know, have fun. I'm not not feeding you. I'm not housing you. I'm not doing anything for you. There was a lot of hatred there. So they didn't want to have anything to do with him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down from heaven fire to destroy them? James and John, wow. You know, are you saying, well, man, those aren't very good disciples. (laughs) This is is at the end, right? He's going to Jerusalem to die. This is like the end of his ministry. And two, two of his best disciples are like, we can call down fire from heaven. We know you got the power. Just tell us. We'll do it. You told Peter he walked on water. You're healing everybody. We can call down fire on these guys. And, um, you know, you might say, gosh, I'm better than James and John. I wouldn't call down fire on anybody. And yet, we have to think for a second. Because, you know, when Jesus was trying to explain how important our thoughts and emotions are, he said... uh, You know you're not supposed to commit adultery, but if you look at a woman with lust, you're committing adultery in your heart. You you know you're not supposed to murder somebody, but if you hate somebody, it's like you're committing murder in your heart. So James and John may have wanted to literally call down fire and kill people. I think there are times if you've ever hated someone or not given them the respect that they deserve or not uh, loved them as Jesus wanted them to, the hate that, that made that well up in you is like murder. And so if anybody treats you badly and you say, I'm not talking to that guy. Oh man, he's lost. He's going to hell for sure. Um, It's not unlike what James and John were were asking Jesus for. Hey, how about if we call down fire from heaven? And don't ever forget what Jesus said to them. Jesus turned and rebuked them and they went to another village. Jesus never got caught up in... um, people doing him wrong and him having to forgive them. He just forgave. He like walked in forgiveness. He didn't have to think about it. So when they bummed him out at that village, uh, he's just thinking, ah, let's go to the next village. There'll be somebody there. They'll let us in. They'll treat us better. Don't worry. And when James and John said, fire from heaven, they deserve it. Jesus is like, no, that's, even if they deserved it, that's not who we are. And they don't deserve it. Acts 7 says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen, 
one of the first disciple deacon evangelist guys. Uh, he preaches the gospel, and the people around him pick up stones and start killing him. And like James and John, he could have said, oh, Lord, give them what they deserve. But he says, no, Lord, into your hands I'm coming, and please don't hold this sin against them. That's the attitude. Do we have influence on heaven? Yes, we do. What we do here, does it have an influence on what happens in heaven? It does. When people hurt us, does Jesus take it as if we were hurting him? Yes. But then the question is, what do we do with that power? It has to be channeled through love and forgiveness at all times. Because that's who our Father is, that's who Jesus is, that's who we want to be. Cool or what? We got a job. Hey, if you can stand up, why don't you stand up? Let me just pray for us. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we realize that there's a lot to do down here. That you didn't leave us down here at a resort. You left us down here to do a job in the world. We thank you that you've given us everything we need to accomplish this. We thank you that the mission is clear. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be alive and active in each of our hearts and lives, that we would know when you've set somebody up for us to meet and talk to. Lord, we just submit ourselves to you in all ways. Let this be a week that we bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hey, we got a lot of Panera Bread out there in the fellowship hall, out the door and to the right. It's all free. Please grab whatever you can.